As the Constitutional Convention wrapped up in September of 1787, no one was really sure if the country would accept the new proposed government. To go into effect, the Constitution required that at least 9 out of 13 states hold ratifying conventions where the delegates present would debate and hopefully agree on endorsing the Constitution. But people were unsure that they would get to that magic number 9. Plus, by creating a new constitution, the convention had technically broken the rules. So what if the current federal government decided that their constitution was illegal? What would happen then? Events moved pretty quickly after the convention finished, so I'm first going to follow events in New York and then we'll return to Philly to see how Pennsylvania's state government reacted. The newly signed Constitution was sent to the Confederation Congress, which was meeting in New York. Along with the Constitution was a letter that justified their actions, basically saying, look, we know this isn't really by the book, but it would be really cool if you guys could just look the other way on this one. Highly irregular, I know, but both of the documents had been signed by George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and a lot of the most influential people in the country. A congressman from Virginia named Richard Henry Lee received a letter from his friend George Mason, one of the few men that had not signed the Constitution. It contained Mason's reasoning why he had refused to sign, in the form of a list of all the problems he found in the document. Lee was receptive to a lot of what Mason had to say, but mainly he was just upset that the convention had defied Congress. The Confederation had its problems, sure, and the Constitution had some solid fixes for those problems, but Lee wasn't ready to break the law to fix it. This could prove an issue for the Federalists. Lee was known as the Cicero of Virginia by his contemporaries, so he could stir up some opposition in Congress that Federalists really couldn't afford this early in the process. Setting legality aside for a moment, what was Congress even supposed to do with the documents? The convention's letter had just said that the Constitution would be sent to Congress and then to the states for ratification. Was Congress supposed to send it to the states? Could Congress try to fix the Constitution before sending it? The letter didn't say, and neither did the Constitution itself. Even if they had clear instructions, there weren't many people showing up to Congress anyway. The Confederation Congress had attendance problems in its normal sessions, but now about a third of the congressmen who regularly attended had been attending the convention instead, so they were still in Philly. With so many absences, they did not have the minimum amount of members needed to conduct any business. If you're looking for a good Scrabble word, this is called a quorum. Without a quorum, they had to wait for the congressmen that had just created the new constitution to return to New York and debate it. That might seem like a conflict of interest, and Lee had refused to attend the convention for that exact reason. By the 26th of September, congressmen had journeyed from Philadelphia to New York and taken their seats in Congress. All the states were represented except for Maryland and, of course, Rhode Island. Congress kicked off a very open-ended debate on what they were even supposed to do with the Constitution. Lee wanted to send the Constitution to each of the states as the convention had recommended, but also release a statement that the convention had broken the rules and thus they were unable to support it. Moderates in Congress were worried about showing how impartial Congress should be, so they recommended sending the Constitution to the states with no comment at all. The Federalists, led by James Madison, disagreed. In this case, being impartial would be impossible. Anything except for outright approval of the Constitution would imply that Congress disapproved of the new government. That didn't sit well with Lee. There was good stuff and bad stuff in the Constitution. Congress should at least say that the states were allowed to propose amendments at their ratifying conventions. Edmund Randolph had actually tried to get a similar concession like this at the convention, and it was met with almost unanimous disapproval. Congress didn't like the idea either, and it was voted down 10 to 1. So if the states couldn't propose amendments, Lee urged Congress to propose amendments to the Constitution themselves. Delegates that had been at the convention were not on board. They recognized that the Constitution as it stood right now was the product of months of compromise. They had barely gotten the Constitution through without the convention falling apart, and proposing amendments now would throw all of that away. Lee remained unconvinced. Simply giving a yes or no to the whole Constitution was like telling a hungry man he could eat 50 meals or have nothing at all. Eventually, someone suggested that Lee should propose what amendments he would personally like to add. 
For starters, he wanted a Bill of Rights, which contained some stuff that looked pretty familiar. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, protection against unreasonable search or seizure of property, and outlawing cruel and unusual punishment. All of this was not explicitly forbidden in the Constitution, and Lee argued that the states would not ratify it until it protected at least a few basic rights. Wait a sec, this is all stuff that George Mason had mentioned in his letter. Even after the convention was over, Mason was still exerting influence over the debates. Lee went on to propose structural changes to the Constitution. Among other things, he criticized the power of the Senate, and he wanted the executive branch to consist of a council instead of just one man. Lee wanted the Senate to be represented proportionally instead of each state getting an equal number of senators. This was a major misstep. If Lee had been at the convention, he would have known that this issue almost destroyed the Constitution before it was even written. The rest of the congressmen recognized this, and sympathetic moderates turned against him. Congress opted to at least attempt to be impartial. The states voted in favor of sending the Constitution to the state legislatures to be debated. They also included a report of the vote, stressing that the vote was unanimous. This was intentionally misleading. The Federalists happened to have a majority of all the state delegations present, and with Rhode Island absent, they couldn't vote against the proposal. So saying the proposal was unanimous made it seem like Congress was on board with the Constitution. By the way, kind of a bonehead move by Rhode Island. Like, if I wanted to oppose something in Congress, I tried my best to, you know, attend the Congress. They kept the debate on the Constitution a secret for months, especially Lee's proposed amendments. Federalists knew that they had to get the Constitution ratified in as many states as they could before opponents of the Constitution could organize in opposition. They wanted to steer the debate away from amendments as much as they could, while calling for ratifying conventions as early as possible. I know that seems like a lot of arguing over a very small things, so let's recap. The convention had sent Congress a new form of government with no instructions on what they were supposed to do with it. Richard Henry Lee wanted either the states or Congress to propose amendments and fix glaring problems with the Constitution, but it was voted down. Finally, Congress sent copies of the Constitution to all the states and insinuated that it had congressional support. The Federalists could move on to the next step of ratification, calling state conventions. Pennsylvania's state government was debating exactly that when the Constitution was being written, so let's rewind to mid-September. The Pennsylvania General Assembly was meeting in a separate room at Independence Hall while the convention wrote the Constitution, so they were among the first to know when they had come to a decision. Pennsylvania Federalists wanted the prestige of being the first state to ratify, so they got to work fast. 3,000 copies of the Constitution were printed in Philadelphia and distributed throughout the state. To give you an idea of Pennsylvania's demographics in the late 18th century, a third of these copies were printed in German. The day after the convention signed the Constitution, the Pennsylvania delegation read it aloud to the members of the assembly at Independence Hall, where a large crowd of observers had gathered in the gallery. The crowd was immediately receptive to the Constitution. A strong federal government that could protect trade and tear down interstate tariffs was really appealing to merchants, craftsmen, and sailors in large cities. As a large trading hub filled with merchants, craftsmen, and sailors, Philadelphia instantly became one of the most vocal Federalist strongholds in the country. Despite being in hostile territory, assemblymen representing Western Pennsylvanians didn't just sit back. George Mason sent his list of objections to an assemblyman named Robert Whitehill, who started to organize opposition to the Federalist faction. Pennsylvania's assembly was unicameral and was dominated by Federalists by about a 2 to 1 ratio. They didn't have the votes to stop the Federalists from calling a convention, but they had one last card to play. The assembly was set to adjourn on the 29th, and it would not meet again until after the annual elections were held in October. If they could delay the vote on calling a ratifying convention, they could slow down the Federalists and maybe gain some seats in the assembly. Another assemblyman, William Finley, reminded everyone that the proposed constitution was illegal, in violation of the Articles of Confederation. He pleaded that they had to at least wait for Congress to make a decision before they did anything. This led to some bizarre arguments where the Federalists, who wanted a strong federal government, argued that Congress did not have the authority to tell the state what to do. The opposition, people who supported states' rights, insisted that they had to wait for the federal government to give them the thumbs up. 
On the morning of the 28th, the day before the assembly was set to adjourn, the legislature voted on calling a convention. After more objections led by Finley and Whitehill, the vote passed 43 to 19. This vote didn't say where or when the convention was supposed to take place, so the assembly decided to iron out the details that afternoon after their midday recess. That afternoon, the assembly reconvened, but they were missing the 19 members that had voted no that morning. The opposition had walked out, leaving the assembly two members short of a quorum. Remember, without a quorum, no vote could be taken. Votes on stuff like ironing out the details of that state ratifying convention. This was a common political tactic in Pennsylvania, and the Federalists had used it in the past, but now the shoe was on the other foot. The remaining members asked really nicely for the opposition to come back, but they refused. They were forced to adjourn for the day. The next morning was the last day the assembly was set to meet. An unofficial dispatch from New York had come early that morning that Congress had unanimously decided to send the Constitution to the states. But the opposition insisted that they had to wait until the formal resolution was received, so they did not return to Independence Hall. The assembly was still two people short of a quorum. The Federalists didn't come this close to a ratifying convention just to lose on a technicality. They had to do something about it. They sent the assembly's sergeant-at-arms to look for opposition. A sergeant-at-arms is an officer responsible for enforcing any rulemaking body's internal rules, and in some cases, they could compel a state legislature to attend sessions. He and four Federalists began walking the streets of Philadelphia looking for any members of the opposition. They caught sight of Finley down the road, but when he saw them approaching, he sped up, turned a corner, and disappeared. When they showed up to where Whitehill was staying, his housekeeper answered the door. They asked her if Whitehill was home, and she said, sure, let me go get him. After a totally not suspicious long wait, she opened the door again and apologized, saying, as it turned out, Whitehill wasn't home after all. Hmm. The sergeant-at-arms eventually found two assemblymen, James McCalmont and Jacob Miley, at a boarding house. After refusing to come back to the state house, the sergeant-at-arms and his backup began roughing them up a little bit. Then they dragged the opposition members back to Independence Hall with torn clothes, protesting the entire way. When they were forced into the assembly, McCalmont shouted that he was being held against his will. But the only other people in the assembly were Federalists, and they shouted and laughed over his calls. He tried to make a break for it, but a crowd of spectators had gathered in the gallery. They shouted, stop him, and blocked him from leaving. The Federalists had gotten their quorum. The Federalists began to lay down the logistics of holding a ratifying convention. Seeing as he was forced to be there, McCalmont decided to take a stand. He argued that it should be held further west, in Carlisle or Lancaster to accommodate the Western Pennsylvanians. He also wanted to get the convention as far from Federalists in Philadelphia as he could. But he and Miley were hopelessly outnumbered. Federalists called an election for delegates to attend a ratifying convention in November, which would be held later that month in Philadelphia. With the convention set in motion, the assembly adjourned. The opposition were justifiably furious. Up to this point, they hadn't been really arguing against any specific part of the Constitution, but now the Federalists had made things personal. They crafted an address that recapped how they had been treated by the Federalists. The majority had steamrolled them at every turn, and basically kidnapped two of their faction so that they could force a vote through the legislature. They pointed out that forcing a vote about calling a convention went against Pennsylvania's state constitution. The state constitution had some really Byzantine roadblocks, like reading any important bill in its entirety three times, usually on different days before it could be voted on. The Federalists had ignored these rules and voted anyway. The Assemblymen went on to list problems with the proposed federal constitution. These critiques were suspiciously similar to what George Mason had sent Whitehill a few weeks before. No freedom of the press, no trial by jury in civil cases, the states would be totally subservient to the federal government, and there were not enough restraints on federal taxing power. The address was a blow to the Federalists' momentum. Kidnapping the opposition and silencing their grievances was giving them a bad reputation. This bad press was only made worse by Richard Henry Lee. He sent copies to Samuel Adams, Elbridge Gerry, George Mason, and Edmund Randolph. A nationwide opposition to the Constitution was starting to form, and it had some prominent politicians on board. Still, the Constitution had been sent to all 13 states for discussion, which was a first step. 
On top of that, Pennsylvania had called a convention. They did it in the most heavy-handed way possible, but they had gotten it done. The next phase of the great debate would be fought at the printing press. An enormous amount of published materials for and against the Constitution flooded into homes. The United States was about to be engulfed in the war of printed words. 